So we had the first speaker that stated client. Then it was the publishing and editorial director of the LH group. And I told him before he started, I said, look, David, I'm about six foot something. I'm about more than 110 kilos of weight. I had a tough childhood. So I'm asking you, please stay on time. <laughs> and David even give us an outlook, a snapshot, so to say, about the global media landscape and changing media habits. Please join me in welcoming David Klein. David, the floor is yours. I'm also actually six foot tall, I have no idea how much I weigh in kilos, but we run a lot of events at that age too, and I totally share the sentiment, don't go wrong. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today to help kick off Horizon's Media Congress. Horizon is a longtime friend and partner um, to Advertising Age, and I want to thank Marcus and the people at Horizon for inviting me. This uh, kickoff topic, snapshot on the global media landscape and changing media habits is obviously a big and complex subject. You could talk for hours about it. Um, not least because we're really right in the middle of whatever it is that's happening uh, in this huge digital shift we're seeing. You know, we can see where we came from, but we can't really quite see where we're going. On the one hand, we go home every day, uh, we watch our favorite TV shows, listen to the radio, read the New York Times Sunday Magazine or Der Spiegel, and life is as it always was, right? But on the other hand, we're also busy updating our Facebook status, we're tweeting our latest thoughts, had mashed potatoes tonight for dinner, uh, and we're instant messaging our kids to stop posting those YouTube videos of the neighbor's Sunday. Now, we group all of those activities from TV to Facebook under the same familiar umbrella category of media, but there are obviously some sharp differences between them and a lot of questions. How will advertising fit into these new social platforms if it does at all? And how do those platforms impact traditional media? I can tell you that for ad ages marketing readers, um, these new digital pathways offer really dramatic opportunities to connect directly with customers, bypassing or supplanting typical marketing strategies. So for the different industry segments in this room, it breaks down this way. For marketers, the smart ones anyway, these platforms obviously have the potential to revolutionize marketing. For agencies and media buyers, on the other hand, these platforms have, a, have um, it just means their job keeps getting harder and more complex. You know, how do you figure out how to do a media buy across three social platforms, mixing it with TV and the website, uh, and maybe you want some billboards too. <coughs> now for media owners, you are entitled to feel very nervous and unsettled. You can't afford to take your eyes off the game, you know, for a minute, for fear that three kids in a garage are gonna come along with an idea that wipes out your whole business. So, my goal this morning is to give a status report on five big trends crucial to the media business going forward. Uh, and let me preview what I'm going to tell you, if, I, if this works. Ad spending growth looks to be phenomenal in two places, right? Anywhere in the developing world and anything digital. So, plan accordingly. Old fashioned TV is supposed to be dying, it's not. There's still everything to learn about advertising and how it can work in a personal relationship platform, and uh, I'm going to review some of the challenges there. Mobile, uh, you know, one day it may actually surpass PCs as a way of accessing the internet, but we are still years away from it being a major ad unit. And more and more these days, technology itself, new technological processes for accessing, displaying, finding, uh, <laughs> content is the content itself, and it's something people are willing to pay for, so we're going to talk about that at the end. Those are the five topics, plus I have a few more slides that are just the charts, not much, not a lot of PowerPoint here, and uh, plus one added cover I'm going to show you at the end just for fun. 
So let's get started and look at ad growth for the next few years. This is with the assumption, of course, that we're not going to have another worldwide economic collapse. And if we do, we're all going to have bigger problems to deal with anyway. So in 2010, ad spending grew around the world on average between 5 and 6 percent overall. That's compared to the horrible nightmare year of 2009, which we'll never speak of again. And that level of 5 percent annual average growth uh, is expected to continue at least through 2014. Almost all media are growing, and even print seems to have stabilized a bit, with the exception of medium-sized newspapers in the U.S., which are still declining. So what's really fueling these forecasts of growth are those two big areas I mentioned. The rapid development of emerging markets and all forms, and all forms of digital advertising. Uh, since the next speaker is Jeff Ramsey of eMarketer, and since he knows all these numbers and statistics much better than I do, I'm just going to give you a quick summary on this and move on. First, China is growing like crazy. Whatever metric you choose to measure, ad spending, bandwidth penetration, mobile usage, consumer spending, and that growth is off a base that isn't all that small anymore. Um, you can see here, uh, at, right now, China is just behind Germany, but sometime in the next year it will move ahead and become the third biggest ad market in the world behind the U.S. and Japan. You can see in this chart how fast China has grown as an ad market over the past 10 years. It was 10th and shortly will be third. And actually, Brazil also is moving up fast. It was 12 in 2000 uh, and 6 now. Now, the other big engine of growth after it, over the next decade is going to be all things digital. And you may think the internet is already huge. It's staggering to see how much uh, traffic growth is still coming. Here's a Cisco forecast of uh, internet usage. You can see the gigantic leaps projected by region. Now, these numbers are in petabytes. Um, if you don't know, a petabyte is one million gigabytes. Um, and here's what the world will be using that traffic for. You can see overall uh, traffic usage should more than double. It's at 18,000 petabytes a month. Uh, 2011 projected, 2014, 42,000, which is astounding, really. Uh, and the single biggest driver, obviously, is the massive amounts of data involved in delivering more and more uh, video over the web. So that's usage. Uh, if we look at internet advertising growth, it's a lot like China. You know, basically double digits for the next few years. Uh, in the U.S., which is about $155 billion total ad market, internet advertising is forecast to grow 30% in the next few years. This is a breakdown. Um, the dollars at the bottom are in millions, so that's really 10 billion, 20 billion, 30 billion. Uh, okay, so you can see the colors. You can see the display and search spending are uh, still zooming ahead. They've not topped out at all. You can also see the dark blue and the light blue, which is mobile and social media. Even though they're growing, they are going to remain a relatively small segment over the next few years in the U.S. Now, the next big symbolically for web advertising in the U.S. will occur when the internet surpasses newspapers to become the number two ad medium, and that'll happen any day now if it hasn't already, um, which is actually proper since it was the internet that helped kill newspapers. Uh, but web advertising, of course, still has a long way to go before it takes the number one spot as the leading ad medium, because the top ad medium in the world is, of course, still television, and that's uh, the next topic I want to talk about. As media folks, we know TV very well. <laughs> TV has been advertising's best friend for a long, long time. And I know that some people, even some of my analysts in advertising age, keep predicting the imminent death of the 30 second TV spot or of TV as we know it. But as of today, as we enter 2011, I can assure you the reports of TV's demise are exaggerated. TV usage, in fact, is still growing around the world. In the U.S., it increased last year in 2010 by 2 percent. It's a new record high. Um, across the planet, the average human being watched 3 hours and 12 minutes of TV last year, which also set a record. In mature markets, viewing is over 5 hours. Its popularity worldwide, you know, it's proven, and it should never be underestimated. 
I have a quote I want to read you, not from a media executive, but actually from a report in the magazine Foreign Policy by a development economist, Charles Kenny. He says, uh, television, it turns out, is the kudzu of consumer durables. Now, that's kudzu. For those who don't know, it's a virtually indestructible vine that swallows up everything in its path. As you can see in the slide here, I think that's sort of a good visual metaphor for television. Uh, anyway, the foreign policy piece continues. Television is so beloved that in the vast swaths of the world where there is still no electricity network, people hook up their TVs to batteries. Indeed, in a number of poor countries such as Peru, more homes have television than electricity. This is not to deny the clear trend that we're seeing of people increasingly doing their viewing on a laptop, a PC, a smartphone. Not many people yet. Um, but it's definitely growing, and the trend is very clear. In the United States, web video consumption rose 53% from 2008 to 2009. Um, that is off a small base, but the trend shows no sign of slowing down. You can see here, um, first quarter of 2009, online video viewing in the U.S. was about three hours a week, compared to 153 hours in front of a TV set. Though so it's actually six and a half hours if you include uh, TV viewing on a mobile device. And it's strong because it's a generational shift. Among young people, there's much more viewing on uh, non-TV set devices. So uh, it's a slow increase, but it is inevitable that it's going to shift. And the big TV companies can see this coming, and they seem uh, to be moving aggressively to set up advertising base or pay models for people who want streaming video or instant downloads or on-demand mobile TV. An attitude, I might point out, that puts them well ahead of how the music business or the book or newspaper industries handle the same kind of crisis. I mean, here's a fun fact of what TV is facing. Cisco, the world's you know, big networking provider, forecasts that by 2014, the digital equivalent of 12 billion DVDs will be crisscrossing online every month. <laughs> I like that fact because that is a lot of video. As an ad business, internet video in the U.S. is projected to be more than $3 billion in 2011, which is bigger than social media. And web video will be a $4 billion ad market by um, 2012, bigger than outdoor advertising in the U.S. and bigger than the advertising in all U.S. TV syndicated shows. And, and there's one other note worth making about TV and social media. It's, it's become clear that even the most technically savvy social media addicts and by that I mean teenagers, um, are not trading the TV viewing for the internet. Instead, they're integrating TV into their social lives. They're IMing and multitasking while they watch their favorite shows. They're keeping track of entertainment news via Facebook and Wikis. And they're tweeting like crazy about what they're watching. So TV programmers don't have to worry that much about competing with social media. It's actually one of TV's best enablers. So that brings us to my third topic, social media. This is, this is really the most exciting discussion in media today, right? How do we monetize all those people talking and sharing their own homemade content among themselves? You know, I grew up in a world where media was really had big gatekeepers and only the professionals, you know, could get on. But now, everybody is a publisher. Everybody can make their own TV show. Everybody breaks news. And everybody talks to everybody in this complex web of relationships and communities. Think about the tidal wave of social content that's flooding over everyone online these days. 24 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute of every day. Some of it professional, but much of it created by regular folks. Facebook says that every week nearly 4 billion, every week 4 billion pieces of content are shared on its site. That includes links, news stories, blog posts, notes, photo albums. And Twitter, you know, the main thing to know about Twitter's influence is that, you know, I wish I could look at the Twitter stream right now to see what everyone in this room is saying so far. In the U.S., they're already archiving all Twitter feeds at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. The new first draft of history will come from a community of billions, you know, 140 characters at a time. At a time. So this is content, obviously, and it's huge vats of content. 
but it's not necessarily media, you know, in a way that we've always practiced it. And agencies and marketers are scrambling to figure out um, how to use it. At AdAge's Media Evolved conference last month, Nick Bryan, the chairman of McCann World Group, told us that he now warns his clients, quote, we aren't just in the storytelling business, we are in the community management business. Now, community management as a marketing tool means tracking viral buzz, seeding the community with useful information and content, setting up instant response teams, it's a lot like high-end customer service, actually. What it doesn't involve is paid advertising. Now, when you do try to talk specifically about advertising, as opposed to community, social media remains a little bit of a mystery. It was only in the last couple of weeks, with the investment of $50 billion by Goldman Sachs into Facebook, that you know, also made their valuation up there with GE and so on. Kind of reminds me of the late 1990s. Uh, it was only with that investment that we saw some good ad spending data about Facebook finally trickle out. So it turns out that in 2009, Facebook had $770 million in revenue and $220 million in profit. In 2010, the next year, you know, as its user base soared, revenue almost tripled to $2 billion and profits nearly doubled to about $400 million. And that's pretty good growth year over year. Not all of that is ad dollars. Some of that revenue comes from purchases of digital goods, you know, for the good farmers of Farmville and things like that. And that's a great source of income. You're selling virtual fertilizer for hard cash. You know, that's, that's my next business. But the majority of the money is ad dollars. And last year, somewhere around $800 million in advertising was spent across all social media in the U.S. alone. It will certainly grow to several billion dollars within a few years. But the longer term question is how far and how fast ad revenue can grow on these platforms. Facebook is in the best situation because of its you know, unbelievable reach, but even it faces certain challenges, and those challenges are even more acute for businesses like Twitter and YouTube and so on. It's not that they can't be overcome, but uh, they're worth taking a look at. When you're in a community setting, you as a consumer, do you want marketers hitting you with ads, even if they're somewhat targeted? And how happy are users to realize that advertisers are targeting them based on their personal preferences, their status, or just their general web activity, what sites they're visiting? You could certainly argue that by targeting the ads, you're making them more useful and less objectionable, you know, but I don't know. Recently, I did 15 minutes of online shopping. I needed a mattress, I went online, I searched, I bought something, I was done. But for the next two weeks, all I saw online, everywhere I went, were banner ads for mattresses. Every side. So finally, I decided I had to go online shopping for cars just to get rid of the mattress ads. Right? And that didn't work. Instead, I started seeing banners promising me a car that would be comfortable to sleep in. You know, that is too hard to do. Uh, advertisers don't have a lot of control over the content connected to their messages in a social uh, platform. A problem uh, that YouTube in particular has been struggling to solve by setting up marketer-friendly channels. But social media, by its very nature, is unpredictable and unfiltered. And the more you try to filter and control it um, to create a, a wholesome advertising environment, or even an edgy advertising environment, the more you might be messing with this whole appeal for the users. Marketers, of course, can participate on social platforms just like the consumers do, and, you know, for free, I mean. And a popular viral video, we can all think of a dozen of them, will go around the world 20 times before a paid message can even be produced. So why pay for media if you can get tons of earned media for free? And, and you know, there are a lot of specialty agencies who are doing just that for their clients. You know, and then the ultimate question, how effective is it going to be to serve ad messages in an environment that's all about friends, recommendation, and trust? Ultimately, even if an advertiser can win friends on the internet, does that popularity translate into sales? So much of the money we're seeing being spent in social media right now is experimental to work out precisely these issues. And 
I'm sure there are ways to work them out, but these are the challenges for social media as an advertising uh, medium. Now, in Facebook's favor, of course, is the fact that its reach is enormous. You know, that's a base, I think, now of 600 million users worldwide. And what I want to talk about next is the way that a third of those, 200 million of them, access Facebook through um, mobile devices. So, uh, mobile is one of those potential ad media that always seems just about on the verge of exploding, but never quite does. As a consumer technology, mobile phones are huge, of course, all over the world. This chart of mobile subscribers by region is, um, you know, basically that bottom number is 4 billion, uh, 4.5 billion almost. Uh, and in countries like China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, the mobile device really is likely to outstrip the computer uh, as a way to access the internet. They may simply leapfrog over the PC stage. Uh, you know, like in India, maybe 7% of the population accesses the internet regularly. They don't have good fixed bandwidth lines. But many, many times more than that on mobile phones. Now, as those phones become internet devices, mobile bandwidth usage will far surpass fixed line broadband. Nonetheless, as an ad medium, mobile is still uh, in its early days. In the U.S., mobile ad spending is uh, just over 500 million. It'll probably reach about 1 billion uh, in 2012. But, you know, that's in, in America's ad market of 155 billion. That's pretty small stuff. Now, part of the issue is content. What kind of ads will work on mobile, certainly what kind of environment? And for now, the early money is on video. As always, TV, after all, is advertising's best friend. Particularly here, you know, given the enormous growth expected for mobile and video. Users are used to commercial, advertisers are used to buying commercial time, so it seems like uh, you, can, you can assume that video ads would be the first big driver for mobile. But there could be other models uh, linked to mobile's ability to use GPS to orient consumers and proximity to local businesses or specific items of merchandise, on-demand couponing, location-based sponsorships, discounts based on your phone scanning a digital code. All these things are possible, many are being tested, um, but for most markets, all of that remains part of a still speculative future. But we all know mobile's time is coming, not maybe in the next few years, but it's coming, and it's interesting a lot of major players. You know, tech giants like Apple and Google are among those that have snapped up uh, mobile ad serving companies. Apple bought Quattro Wireless, um, Google bought AdMob, and other players in that mobile ad serving space include Microsoft, AOL, and Yahoo. So, what's striking about that is? Exactly. <laughs> They're all major technology companies. And they're all vying to become the gatekeepers to lots and lots of traditional media revenue. So that brings me to my last topic about technology as content. Oh, and this is my adage, my one adage slide. This is our Thanksgiving holiday cover about the media issue. You've got the whole family around the table with their iPads and smartphones and Kindles and laptops, even a virtual turkey. That's not even the future, that's today. Right? Traditionally, media companies have made their money connecting audiences to advertisers and profiting through control of that access to the consumer. But as the audience migrates to digital media, that gatekeeper function is being taken over by companies whose whole DNA is essentially technical. Run down the list. Um, today, one of the biggest music distributors is a computer company, Apple which produces no music, owns no studio, manages and nurtures no bands. And by the way, Apple also has strong control over the newest media form, apps, right? They don't have total control because of the competing Android uh, operating system, but they still have strong uh, oversight. So you, Mr. Media Owner, you can't even think about launching a successful app on the iPhone or the iPad unless you do it exactly the way Apple tells you. The biggest bookstore is Amazon, with no retail outlets. And with every new e-reader development, from the Kindle to the Nook to the iPad, it becomes less and less clear how publishers, how authors will be paid, much less how traditional publishers, publishing companies will make money. And then, of course, there's Google, 
certainly one of the biggest and most dominant media companies on the planet, but it's a pure internet company. It publishes no content of its own. So we in the media like to say that content is king, and of course to some extent it is, but more and more these days, uh, I have to tell you, it shares that throne with pure technology. Um, and, you know, if I'm really having this debate in a bar, I would say technology is king and not content. And right now, it's the smart digital technology companies that have poised, really, to become the media giants of the 21st century. You know, we're working now in a, in a consumer environment where there is as much value in compelling ways to search, access, display, and participate in content as there is in the content itself. In a few famous cases, of course, it's more valuable than the content. The ability to do a Google search is far more important than any single article Google finds. <coughs> Even if you're a traditional media company, your audiences want more than just content, right? Creating the consumer's new digital habits, they want a much better ability to locate, aggregate, and socially curate that content. In a world where everybody's spending a lot of time creating and consuming their own self-made content, developing new ways for consumers to um, process, to handle, to deal with that, all those different forms of content, that's where the big and disruptive innovations are going to happen. Now that's a hard place for a traditional media company to play. We do content, not coding, right? But I think you, you can see, and I'm sure you're going to hear over the next two days, there's a Darwinian process, a survival of the fittest process that's happening right now that's very much going to favor companies with serious digital traits and strengths. Frankly, given their inherent vulnerability to the internet, I think um, this is especially true for magazines and newspaper companies. For print. So, to be a dynamic player and thrive over the next decade, as opposed to sort of hanging on and surviving in a shrinking niche, we're all really going to have to act, think and act like digital companies. Literally. I mean, as many coders and software engineers and digital experts as you can hire, you need to bring into your organization. When you look at all the growth trends we've been discussing this morning, at the digitization sweeping through society, at the changing needs of our audience, the lesson I draw is that, like it or not, uh, we are all really in the technology business. And we all embrace it, because that is the meaning of business today. Thank you for listening. You've all been very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.